Ladies and gentlemen, uh, warm greetings to everyone. We are already running out of time. So I think uh, our conversation will be very precise and uh, I hope you will enjoy this conversation. And uh, you know that as a moderator, before that, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Mainul Islam. I work in Dhaka University in the Department of Population Sciences as a faculty there. So, but, uh, and uh, also uh, we have one distinguished uh, 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 panelist, I will say, and, but our conversation will be the dialogue between uh, Dr. Uh, Nizamuddin Ahmed, the Vice Chairman of CSU Constituency uh, Steering Committee of the Global Alliance uh, Vaccine Initiative, that is the Gavi. Uh, everyone knows about that one. And I think uh, also I would like to say that Dr. Ahmed is also a public health specialist. My background is demography. I work on population studies and one of the questions came out from the data. I was responding in a different way, but I think the data issues also uh, relate to our conversation after a while. So Dr. Ahmed, as I mentioned to you, he's a public health specialist. He's also an executive director of the Shastho uh, Shurokha Foundation and chief executive officer of the Synesis Health. So I think uh, the conversation will be linked uh, between public health, vaccination, COVID-19, displaced and vulnerable populations. So uh, in that context, uh, what I would like to uh, 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 say, to dear audience, is that uh, on November 15, just a few days ago, the world experienced 8 billion population in the world. And uh, although you know that the growth rate of the overall population growth rate is declining, but size of the total population is still increasing. And unequal growth rate is experiencing all over the world in a different dimension, different ways. But the question is like that now, every year, one, every 12 year, 1 billion population is increasing in the world. Earlier it was taking a long time. But now, at this moment, uh, uh, it, uh, as the size of the population will be increasing, and what we are thinking that these are numbers, but once we are talking about the numbers, also we need to think about the quality issues. So in that context, big numbers, big challenges, also big opportunities, but we definitely need to think about rights and choices of the every individual. That is the ultimate uh, motto of development and rights should go together. So in that context, I think background, I would like to ask a few questions to Dr. Ahmed and, uh, and uh, I, I think a distinguished audience uh, uh, and also raise some questions later if you have time. But I have three, basically three to four questions to you. And I would request that if you briefly answer those questions, that will be easier uh, to go there. So my first question is like that, as you know, that you are working now on the vaccine, vaccination issues and you are involved with Gabi and also representative from these, our territory. So regarding uh, one of the issues, like if you think about the WHO worldwide data, we think that unequal access in terms of vaccination. And if, we, I, if I give you the figure just from today from WHO website, what we have seen that low-income country, they have uh, actually, uh, uh, it's like only 20.98%. So if you think that every five people won, and what's about the high-income countries, if you think about it, that is 74.8%, and global level is 64. So definitely there is a regional imbalances out there, and Bay of Bengal area particularly, where the countries like Bhutan, Nepal, Thailand, Bangladesh, Maldives, Sri Lanka, India, Indonesia, East Timor, Myanmar, uh, we have seen this thing. I mean, among these countries, actually, some of the countries did very well, like for Bhutan, even for, uh, I would like to say, uh, even for Thailand, and even for Bangladesh too, uh, in, in compared to others, no doubt. But Myanmar position is like only 50%, 50.52%. 50 so definitely lower income country and uh, upper income countries and also regional imbalance we have. My now question to you first, question as a as expert in the public health, why do you think so such variations in terms of access to vaccination and particularly how does the uh, vaccination alliance like Gabi, you know, work for developing countries through a combination of government and non-government organization and CSOs? Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me as well. Uh, I, I think it's, this is a pertinent question everywhere we face. Uh, when you say the Bay of Bengal conversation today, that illustrates very clearly we're connecting global, regional, and local. Uh, that's how the, the Bay of Bengal conversation today. And COVID, we have seen the, the you know, uh, responses of the COVID variation from the context, both from developed country to developing country, and, and also the different context as well. The, the specific question to answer why the world having such a disproportionate and different CSS in the vaccination at this point of time. Uh, 
Now, if you see that over 70% of the global population at least receive one single dose globally, uh, which is a, a great uh, opportunity that people have the access to that. Second is also we need to really re recognize that this is ever in the history of the mankind. The development of vaccine happened uh, the ever fastest than uh, what is happening in the past. Like, you know, we, we talked, the previous session talked about within 362 days, the emergency vaccine comes into a life for prevention. And now it is coming to 100 days so that the, the scientist and the researcher and the uh, associated you know, industry and the professionals are working very hard. And even you'd be happy to see 193 vaccine in pre-trial at this point of time. And, and 44 uh, candidate of the vaccine in the first phase and 49 in the second phase. And the globally now 23 vaccines are in use at this point of time. The question is how fast we can get it. Uh, I living in Bangladesh and conference in Bangladesh today, I would say Bangladesh was smart, particularly the government was smart to access the vaccine in a very fast space. So that you see Bangladesh second dose now over 75% and the booster dose is over 50%. Many country due to the shock of COVID, not because of only the money and, and the access issue, because of the shock, shock and traumatize and, and ability to reach uh, to Gavi uh, and other industry, they could not really be in the pipeline of the vaccine. So some of the country, even a high income country having a low coverage than low income country uh, in the world. So that, that is one of the things we have seen, the, the government policy matters yeah. and, and that really take the vaccine to take forward. But also we have seen individual behavior matters. That's how the vaccine hesitancy uh, came in. You have seen in Australia how, how late they started uh, to t receive the vaccine is a developed country, but now they're in the pace again. So, so there are always issue uh, of the policy decision of the government of the host country, as well as people acceptance to receive the vaccine as well. We usually forget to, always we are very happy to talk about more supply, but we forget about the demand creations. And uh, so that we always talk about now that supply could be available, but people may not be interested to take the vaccine. And we have seen the example in the world. So that's, that's how the, the mobilization and also in the national policy guideline has prepared globally in the, in the world. But also resource constraints also a matter in some Absolutely. context, right? So now next question to you regarding the context of data, because I think one of the participants raised about these things and we are thinking really thinking about the quality of the data. So in that context, we have seen in the Bay of Bengal region, particularly during the COVID causality death was very high in India. And uh, if you think about uh, uh, the total number of figures, then we have seen Indonesia, then Thailand, and then comes to the Bangladesh is like, uh, 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 in fact, uh, it's like 22.03 uh, uh, 2 million people infected. But the question is regarding the death rate, not the infection. So in death rate, we found it in Bhutan, it was only 21 cases. But for Maldives, like 311, I know that these are very small country, but it's okay. But Nepal is like 12,109. Sri Lanka is like 16,793. But in context of Thailand, Indonesia, and, in, and India, the number is much higher. And once the WHO in May launched a report, report on excess mortality due to pandemic, and that was, that was showing that actually the states of what they referred, it is 2.7 times higher uh, death rates or causality death uh, experience. So in that context, we found that some of the countries didn't accept uh, the findings like India, even our Bangladesh too. But the question is like, we know that these are the, uh, are the tested cases. There are also death happens due to, uh, you know, different uh, indirect estimation uh, causalities of death are also happening there. In that context, also we see uh, in a general perspective, like WHO statistics showing that that six out of 10 death, six death are not reported till at this moment in the, the, the time when we are talking about the digitalization. So in that context, how do you see the dispute among member states of WHO and COVID causality, particularly these figures, and what do you think about the quality of data and availability regarding policy formulation? And we need really to ensure good quality and availability of data for making better policy formulation. So would you kindly respond uh, shortly? 
Thank you. There are two aspects of this question. One is re related to the quality of the data. The second is the ability to produce the data. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the regional country or global situation, which we have seen from public health uh, analysis, it's very clear the ability of the country is the first requirement for responding to any pandemic. Uh, like in Bangladesh and many other countries, like as you mentioned, uh, do not have right surveillance system in place. And in many countries, even in, even in uh, developed countries, are not really ready. The, the speed of COVID really put people uh, in, into the stress for expanding and developing the system. So the surveillance system is not as such ready to report properly the actual number of the cases. That is why the public health estimation now is three times higher than what is, what is being reported. Right. Second part is the quality of the data depending on the, on the people who are working here and in the system. So that, the, I think that's where we need to, this is a, one of the lessons I would say learned from the COVID, that every country, we should not forget that the pandemic is over. We are not yet get out of pa uh, pandemic COVID. We are within the COVID still. Right. And, and we're talking about now readiness for the next pandemic. Right, right. So the, this is the lesson that each country has to take uh, to rebuilding and redefining the health system if mm. they want to continue to respond in the future. Okay, that's fine. Very good to know. And now the next question to you regarding, you know that 1.3 million Rohingya people are in Bangladesh at this moment. That means these are Bangladesh government treated them as a forcefully displaced Myanmar national, that is FDMN. So if you think about these, uh, one of the crowded places in Cox's Bazar area, so highly dense situation, there are no doubt, but uh, Bangladesh is uh, doing extremely well regarding treating them. But the question still remains regarding Rohingya issues. Uh, I found that they have the highest, um, highest number of TFR. That means total birth rate is quite high. Even, even the uses of contraception in terms of family planning is quite low. And if they live in Bangladesh for a longer, another five or 10 years, every year around 30 to around more than 30,000 Rohingya new baby, born babies are born there. So in that context, actually, how do you think about uh, management of their family planning or reproductive health care services in that places? Are we on the right direction? Uh, I, I would say that uh, Bangladesh so far are uh, doing very good. Uh, this is the largest refugee population in the world, the ever largest in the history. And a country like Bangladesh, developing country, smaller country, is, is managing this uh, 1.2 million population with, with the basic things and, and the prevention and quality of the life can be improved. Uh, I, I, I'm very optimistic uh, having the ability of Bangladesh to expand, uh, like managing the, the Rohingya populations. And there are collaborative work between government and private sectors and the civil society as well. Uh, a particular point, as you mentioned, TFR rate is very high. If we see the the pattern from the, the Rohingya population in their past, they are not used to and neither exposed to access to the family planning devices or, or any contraceptive or prevention methods. So this is a new learning for them, uh, which is probably we need to create the demand uh, so that people can really get mobilization and understand better. And so linking with the supply system as well. So that's what government is trying to work with the international community and the national organizations and the CSOs and the local government in, in the Rohingya community. Well, thank you. So the thing is that, you know, still a lot of things need to do, multi-sectoral collaboration are needed there, no doubt we understand. But the, now you see in Bangladesh at this moment, the time when we are talking uh, and discussing, Bangladesh has experienced last 50 years of independence. In terms of public health progress, you know, definitely you can see that major changes. So just can say, Two or three examples in a very brief, because we are yeah. short of time, we, they, they will go for lunch. I think distinguished audience, lunch, lunch, sorry, for dinner. So I think if you can categorize the three example areas of what can le take lesson from Bay of Bengal, other areas from Bangladesh. What I think, think? Uh, thank you very much. This is, this is very interesting uh, question. At the, uh, at the age of 50 years of a country and a Bay of Bengal conversation lessons learned, one of the first lessons I would say, this is being disseminated, that's the prevention of death among under five children, maternal death, and, and due to the utilization of the vaccination program in Bangladesh. That is how our Honorable Prime Minister being rewarded by Global Alliance for uh, Vaccine Alliance, Gavi, in 2018 as a vaccine hero in the world. So that's the first lesson, and Bangladesh is exporting human 
train him and resource to all over the world now for expanding the vaccine pro vaccination program in Africa and in other countries as well. The second lesson I would say, the population control and TFR as you mentioned. Uh, in, if you look at 1970, it was 7.2 TFR and now it's 2.1 TFR. So that's a yeah. significant decline, not because of only family planning program, but also the understanding of the population has increased, access has been increased and service has been increased and health sector has worked quite tremendously. And we know that 6,000 population having an access to one health worker. Yeah. That is the second significant achievement I would say in Bangladesh. Third one, prevention of number of epidemics in this country. Two epidemics we have faced. One, all of we know in 2000, the HIV epidemic came in Bangladesh as well. So it was 7.5% in Bangladesh. Now it's getting to under 1%. Under that because of very integrated, coordinated response by the government and participation of the civil society, private sector, and the, and the citizen as well. So that's a third example and yeah. where... Oh, well, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, three important lessons you have already mentioned, but I think uh, if we make a, make a link with different way, like still maternal mortality reduction is a big challenge for Bangladesh because only eight years we have at this moment, but we need to make a reduction into 70. How will progress? I think that's a big question. Another one, TFR is stagnant at this moment. CPR is already, definitely we have a very good performances, but now since 2011 to now, it's almost stagnant and adolescent fertility rate is quite high. Even child marriage issue is a major concern for Bangladesh, which will actually interrupt not only reproductive health, also for other sustainable development goals also impacted there. So I think we are going to close our uh, conversation, but do, do you like to any, ask any question to me? I, I just... Uh, <laughs> or uh, an audience can also ask one question, I think, because we are going, going uh, closing the, uh, our interaction. Thank Please. you. I, I will just want to make one more comment. Uh, like all of you need to understand that work and the world never be in the back to 2018. Never and ever. We are in 22. We are not going to get the life back in 2017. The way we move, the more way we had social life, way we have personal life, nothing going to come back. So we need to believe that by heart from the public health perspective, we, we are seeing the future. If you want to live better, we need to prepare better. That is why we are saying prepared, preparedness, preparedness and preparedness uh, on the health system. So help people to get better life. Right. Second part is also, we, we, we should not really forget health is one part, but we need to really look more on comprehensive and integrated way to be more efficient and more effective. Right. So that the more collaboration, more partnership, government and private sector is very, very essential. Absolutely. I think uh, yeah, definitely government and non-government organizations, they should come forward together. No doubt for in terms of development, if you think about the changes in Bangladesh society, it's not only government alone have done it. Definitely non-government organizations and also other CSUs, they work together and um, it's yeah. work together, like for vaccination program, yeah. even for family planning program, what you mentioned. But the question, uh, I, I'd like to close the uh, uh, interaction here, but oh, dear audiences, it's a, it's a, it's a short in introduction and uh, interaction between, between Dr. Nizamuddin Ahmed and me, but you see just we are eight years ahead of SDGs. We have a 169 targets and out of 169 targets, how many targets can be achievable? Data is one of the important problem. And like I would say only 34, 37% data are publicly at this moment readily available. And most of the data are not available yet, it not only for Bangladesh, but also for the Bay of Bengal regions area. So we need to produce data and, and based on the data policy making and implementation and intervention should be ensured. But at the end, what I would like to say, the message of sustainable development goals leave no one behind. We are progressing, we are developing, but still inequality persists in the society. Still subgroups of populations are varied in terms of the quality of life. To me, the development means to enhance the quality of life of the people, not only economic growth, not only GDP's growth, but real choice and rights should be ensured at the individual level. What we are saying that rights and development should go together. So with this, I think I would like to 
uh, thanks uh, to our uh, our interactive partner, I will say, and uh, Dr. Nizamuddin Ahmed for giving an wonderful time here. And thank you very much for uh, giving your patience here, so those who are here, and uh, and we made the conversation. And you, I think, uh, you have experience. And thank you, thank you very much.